Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. It's me, isn't it? And then the end of to Timothy, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus ill in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for, for that impromptu reading. I'm sorry we didn't quite manage to hear you, uh, Wendy. Um, and um, well, it's good to, to be with you this morning. Nice to be here. And uh, today we're starting to read a new letter, a new part of the Bible. And uh, some of you will know that we uh, have been reading the book of Judges. Well, we finished that book. And so today we're starting a new letter. We're starting a letter in the Bible called To Timothy. And it was written almost 2,000 years ago, um, probably in the mid 60s AD. And it was written from one Christian leader to another. So perhaps an obvious question for us today is why read it? Well, chapter 1, verse 1, if you've got a Bible there in front of you, you may like to glance down. Chapter 1, verse 1 gives us one reason. The author is a reason that we should read the book. It's from Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So this is a pretty unique letter. It's written by Paul, and he was a first century Christian who'd been personally commissioned by Jesus Christ. So this letter, old as it is, carries God's authority. That's why it's in the Bible. But maybe you're thinking, well, you know, I'm glad it's in the Bible. And I'm sure it would be a really good thing for our church pastors, to, um, that's Chris and Steve and, and, um, and Chris, um, to meet up and study it. But I'm sure it's not quite as relevant for the rest of us. Well, there's a good clue that Paul expected this letter to be heard by more than just Timothy. The very last verse that Steve read um, chapter 4, verse 22, the, the you, uh, sorry, I'll start again, the your is singular and the you is plural, okay? So um, let me just share my screen again. Um, and you can see here the very last verse, okay? The Lord be with your spirit. That's Paul prays for Timothy. And then Paul says, grace be with you all. So it seems that Paul is now praying for everyone else who's listening in. Even though it was written from Paul to Timothy, it seems <coughs> like Paul expected other people to be listening. And maybe that's Paul's church in Ephesus. And if that's right, it's a bit like Paul had emailed Timothy directly and he's carbon copied the congregation so they can read what he said as well. So, even though 2 Timothy applies most directly to church pastors, it's not just a letter for leaders. It's a letter for the whole church. And yes, there'll be primary implications for, for church pastors, but there will be secondary implications for the church family. Uh, and there are plenty of those. So, for example, if we end up um, at some stage in our lives, um, needing to move home and find a new church or perhaps you, you find yourself in a church that needs to choose a new pastor 2 Timothy is a letter that will help you know what to look for and also it's, um, it's a letter that's going to help church members support their pastors um, and, and it's going to help congregation the, the congregation to encourage and uh, the pastor and prioritize, help them to prioritize the main things that they should be doing. 
which of course is vital for the health of the whole church. It's also going to be a letter that helps people who do pastory type things. So perhaps if you're involved in children's work or youth work, or you help lead a home group, or you, well, of course, at lockdown time, it's not happening, but you visit a nursing home or, or, or go to a prison ministry or something like that. Even parents, people who minister the good news about Jesus to others, it's going to help us if we're in that situation. It's also going to help if um, to set the expectations and priorities for normal church life um, in the days we live in. And to have the right expectations is crucial, isn't it, um, when we're in difficult times. And perhaps there are some people who are logged on this morning who aren't Christians yet. And you think, well, that's all very well for the church leaders. That's all very well if you're a regular member uh, of the congregation here. But for those of us who aren't Christians, 2 Timothy is going to be a letter that shows what normal church life is like. And, and so it's going to be a great opportunity to find out what the Christian life involves. So whoever we are, I hope we're all a bit more persuaded and excited about reading this wonderful letter that Paul wrote to Timothy all those years ago. Now, what we're going to do to start with is we're going to have a think about the background to, to this letter. And the background of a letter changes how we read it. Okay. Now, just imagine for a moment that you received a letter from Judge Judy, okay, summoning you to court. Now, it makes a big difference to know that Judy is your auntie who's inviting you to her slightly unusual cops and robbers themed 60th birthday party. Okay. But it just so happens that your auntie Judy is also a high court judge. And if you've been recently arrested for stealing lorry loads of loo roll, you'd maybe have a different feeling as you tore open Judy's letter. Perhaps a similar letter, but the background to it changes the way we read it. And so we're going to think for a moment about the background of 2 Timothy now. Now, I've, uh, and I've written up a little booklet um, introducing the letter. I'll share that at the end which has got some of the Bible references to the things I'm about to be talking about. But we know from the opening sentences, 2 Timothy was written by Paul to Timothy. And Paul was a great missionary pastor who was now a prisoner in Rome. And he knew that he was nearing the end of his life. And Timothy was a younger church pastor. Um, Paul sees himself as Paul's, uh, as Timothy's spiritual father. Paul calls him my dear son in chapter 1, verse 2. So 2 Timothy is going to be a close personal letter. Now I've got a little timeline for us here. So um, hopefully there we are. There it is, a line. And, um, and, and what we see is if we, we can plot on that timeline some of the history of Paul and Timothy. OK, and, and, you'll, and you, if you notice there that by this point, by the point that Paul writes to Timothy, which is at the bottom of the timeline, Paul and Timothy had been serving together through thick and thin for about 15 years. And, and Timothy, sometimes called Timid Timothy, that hardly seems a fair nickname to me. I think um, someone's called him Troubleshooter Timothy. I think that would be better. Because in Paul's first letter, he told Timothy to stay um, in Ephesus to sort out some problems with false teachers. And it's likely in 2 Timothy, uh, he's still there. But it seems now that Timothy's in an even more difficult situation. And he may even be tempted to give up. You have a look at chapter 1. And verse 15 of this letter, Paul says, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. And, uh, and if we don't know, uh, in those days, Asia, here's a map. Can you see Asia was part of um, modern day Turkey? And um, 
and and uh, and if you see Ephesus, there it is. I've put a green circle around it, and Ephesus, which is probably where Timothy was, um, in, uh, was was having big problems because people in Asia were giving up on Paul. Okay, and Paul had spent a long time there. He'd done lots of missionary work there. About ten years or so earlier, Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. And the gospel had had a powerful impact in that place. But now, Paul and his gospel message are being deserted on a grand scale. And so Paul writes this letter to Timothy. And it's as if he says, Timothy, don't abandon me. Don't abandon my gospel. Please stay loyal to me and the truth about Jesus. Paul lays it all out in chapter 1, verse 8. He says, Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And before um, we've even dug too far into this letter, the first point has tumbled out. And let me uh, show you what that is on the screen. Um, so. Uh, in the first thing we see from this letter, before we've even looked at much of what's in it, we've seen that a good church has gone wrong. Seems like the church in Ephesus, where Timothy probably was, has gone wrong. People are giving up on Paul and things like that. So that's the first thing. And it's a sad truth, but it's one that we need to reckon with today. It seems that things have gone wrong in Ephesus and even Timothy was in danger. Humanly speaking, even the biggest, safest churches can go off the rails. Uh, some people here may have heard of the church, St. Helens Bishopsgate, which is a very large congregation in the city of London. And over the last 50 years, they've had uh, lots of faithful Bible teaching. And so you might look at a big church in London with a good history of Bible teaching and think, yeah, that's a really safe church. But I remember, I think Steve and I were, were perhaps at a conference together somewhere, and uh, the rector there, the, 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 the senior pastor, I think he said something like, you know, it seems like Hel St. Helens lurches from one problem to the next. And for those of us looking on the outside, we think, oh, well, it wouldn't look like it. It's like a big safe church. But no church is immune from going wrong. I, I'm, I wonder if, if a number of us here and um, this morning have been part of a church that seems like it's, it's gone a bit wrong. Um, be interesting, maybe just to pause for a moment um, and have a little poll. So I wonder if, if anyone here has ever known of a good church that has gone wrong. Does anyone here like to, um, to vote in that? You, you don't have to vote, but it'd be interesting to know if anyone's known of a good church that's gone wrong. Um, and I've given yes, no, or maybe. We'll give it a, a moment. And uh, I can give my mandatory gag, and if you're watching on the recording, please do not vote. And um, interesting, I, I, I'm seeing the results come in, and we've had, uh, well, about 64% 60, uh, of people have voted so far. So if you'd like to vote, uh, now's the chance. I'll, I'll give it a few more seconds. And um, votes are, are slowing down um, at the moment. Okay. Well, I think we'll, we'll pause it there. Um, but um, really interesting, if I show you the results, can you see this? 64% of people who uh, voted said they've known of a good church that has gone wrong. 21% haven't and 15% haven't been sure. But isn't that interesting? That we look at the history in, in this letter, about the background to this letter, and it seems like a good church has gone wrong, and actually lots of us know um, that that kind of thing happening. It, it's a sad truth, but that's sometimes what, that, what happens. And, and I think perhaps a take-home point for us, and to start with as, as all saints, is that we can't be complacent. We can't cruise. We can't just expect things to keep going as, as they always have done. We need to have the right expectations, because sometimes uh, good churches and go wrong. That's the first point. Um, and some time ago, we talked about um, having a lifeboat mentality, not a 
cruise ship mindset. The church should be more like a crew on a lifeboat than passengers on a cruise ship. And here at All Saints, we're not perfect, and we've had setbacks, and we've had encouragements. But by the grace of God, our new vision document commits us to prayerfully proclaiming Christ from the Bible. And this isn't going to happen automatically. We've just seen, haven't we, by looking at the history of the church in Ephesus, that good churches can go wrong. And while not all of us, not every one of us is, is, a, is a pastor here at the church, every Christian can partner together in supporting the proclamation of, of Christ. And I, and I could give you lots of little applications of how to do that now. Um, uh, but, but I trust that a number of those kind of things are going to come out during the rest of the series. But for now, the main application is just to reckon with this truth that good churches can go wrong. And that may involve a change in thinking for some of us, or maybe it's a wake up call, um, a reminder for others of us. So there's the problem. OK, Paul is writing to Timothy in a situation where things seem to be going wrong. Lots of people are abandoning Paul and his gospel. So what's Paul's solution? Well, he writes this letter to Timothy. And if we read the beginning of the letter and the end of the letter closely, we'll notice that I, I think Paul has tucked some key themes of the letter into them. So the rest of them, our sermon really is going to be, be a bit of an overview of what Paul is going to say in this letter. And if you're a little bit geeky, um, you may enjoy the fact that the first letters of today's headings spell GPS, Good Promise and Share. So this sermon is hopefully a global positioning system for 2 Timothy. So we've seen that Steve's giving me the thumbs up. Thanks, Steve. There we go. So good churches go wrong. And here's Paul's two part solution. He essentially says, look, Timothy. You need a promise perspective. And that will mean we can share in suffering for the gospel when things are tough. So firstly, a promise perspective, a promise perspective. Listen for Paul's promise perspective in chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. You see, as Paul stares death in the face, remember, he's in a prison. He says that in his letter. He thinks he's, he's nearing death's door. That's what he says in chapter four. He, as Paul calls Timothy to suffer for the gospel, all tough things, it's striking that he describes his goal as the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. That Paul has a good news or a gospel vision he has a promise perspective. That's how he views life. And, and notice a few things about the gospel, which Paul calls the, a promise of life. And notice it's a promise of life, full, eternal life of knowing and enjoying God. Notice that the gospel is a promise. See, for the Christian, um, not only is the future certain, but the best is yet to come. Um, and not only is it a promise, um, uh, it's also, um, it's a promise in Christ Jesus. It's, uh, the gospel is the good news about the Son of God who came to earth, who took the punishment his people deserved when he died on the cross. He rose again to reign as king forevermore. It's the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And finally, notice that this promise is enjoyed in Christ. And every word matters. And notice that all who are united to Jesus Christ by God's spirit, all who turn away from sin and trust in him, enjoy this promise of life. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, you know, ask, have, have you ever considered this promise of life? That's what Christianity is all about. It's about the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Don't miss out on this wonderful promise. Today is a great day to put your trust in Christ. And this promise of life in Christ is both Timothy's motive and his message. 
This is the message that Timothy must proclaim. This is the motive that will keep Timothy going amidst the suffering he faces. See, Timothy is to have a promise perspective. Perhaps just to illustrate this, I've got a, a diagram. Um, nice to have a little diagram. And this sort of, uh, and here you can see, well, imagine this is the here and now, and you had a choice. If you had to choose one of these two boxes, which box would you choose? Would you choose the avoid suffering box or the share suffering box? And you think, well, you look at it like that and you think, well, it's a no brainer, isn't it? But we'd rather avoid suffering than share in it. But as Andrew Satch and Tim Hulms write in their little book, if this world is all there is, self-sacrifice is for idiots. But if we look at the other half of their diagram, it's a no-brainer the opposite way around. You see, if we share in suffering now, if we follow Paul and Timothy and trust in Christ, yes, there will be suffering, but we'll enjoy eternal life, the promise of life. Um, they, they write, um, no sacrifice is too great if eternal glory is on offer, while no temporary pleasure could be worth eternal loss. The choice of a rational person depends entirely on whether he or she believes God's promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. And we're going to see throughout this letter that Paul writes, and he keeps focusing Timothy on this eternal future promised by God. That is what will keep Timothy going in the present. And by God's grace, if we're Christian believers, that is what will keep us going when being a Christian is really tough. It's remembering the promise of life. And in the Lord Jesus. And that's not the only reassurance Paul gives Timothy as he begins. Have a look at chapter 1, verse 2. He says to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is going to say some things to Timothy, which may have made him, made him feel rebuked and anxious. And so it's, it's really important that Paul begins with these three great foundation stones. Grace, God's kindness to undeserving people. Mercy, God's kindness to helpless people. And peace, God's kindness to people who were once his enemies. God has now created harmony. And this is the firm foundation that Timothy needs to root his identity on to face the future, to face this really difficult situation. These are three great blessings. Of God's promise of life. And unless we miss it because it's so obvious, notice in verses 1 and 2 how focused Paul is on God. In two verses he's mentioned Jesus three times and God twice. So like Timothy, pastors need to be firmly rooted in God and his promises um, to hear the challenges of this letter. Indeed every Christian that all of us need to build our lives on the same firm foundation to keep going. Um, we need a promise perspective. And, and a promise perspective um, is what we need um, in order to, uh, to share in suffering for the gospel. Um, share in suffering for the gospel. And that's, if you like, a headline for the whole letter, which Timothy would have read by the time he gets to the final verses. Um, I've tried to summarise the letter like this, okay? Hold on to your hats. Um, Dear Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't abandon me or my gospel, like other people are. Instead, share in suffering by guarding the gospel by preaching the word in view of Christ's return. Lots of love, Paul. That's a pretty dense uh, sort of summary, but I hope you kind of get the gist. And we're going to be unpacking and some of those ideas in the coming weeks. But remember, we know that many people had abandoned Paul, but he still had some loyal friends. And so finally, in that second half part of our reading today, though, remember, the very last verses um, of the whole letter, Paul says this, chapter 4, verse 19, Greet Pris Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus ill in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. 
and uh, Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Now, um, there are nine people mentioned at the end of Paul's letter, and the last four only appear in the Bible in this verse. But we know more about the first five people that Paul mentions. And I take it that Timothy would have known Priscilla and Aquila and uh, uh, Onesiphorus household and Erastus and Trophimus. I guess he would have known those people. Timothy would have likely known from Romans chapter 16 that Paul calls Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers for Jesus in Christ Jesus who risk their lives for me. Timothy certainly knew from earlier in, in this letter that um, um, Onesiphorus often refreshed Paul. You can read about it in chapter one. And uh, Paul writes, Onesiphorus all, often refreshed uh, Paul and was not ashamed of Paul's chains. When he found him in Rome, he searched hard for Paul until he found him. So Onesiphorus, he was willing to find where Paul was in jail and help him. So these people that Paul mentions are people who'd supported Paul and his gospel ministry, even at personal cost to themselves. They illustrate the main point of this letter, which is sharing suffering for the gospel. And I wonder if this might just be a subtle reminder for Timothy of what he's just read in the rest of the letter. We, we can't be sure. And clearly Paul's main point in these verses is to greet people and to come and visit him. But I wonder if it's a little reminder. And, and as I've said, the, the big message of 2 Timothy um, for, for pastors like Timothy is that they're to share in suffering for the gospel. And that's the second uh, or the third thing on the screen there, to share in suffering for the gospel. And it also means that people who do pastory type things that I mentioned earlier, will also find gospel ministry inconvenient and difficult. That's actually normal, and it's reassuring to remember that. In fact, um, Paul writes in chapter 3, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Every Christian will find times where they have to suffer for the Lord Jesus. But as we read this, the conclusion of this letter in chapter 4, it's cheering to remember but this isn't something we do alone. Paul listed those uh, nine names, didn't he? And one uh, scholar has gone through and, uh, and added up the, the, the lists of names that Paul puts down in the New Testament. And they reckon that there are about a hundred different names that Paul writes in letters and things like that, listed as his partners, a hundred people that Paul knew and was, was working with. See, all of us, uh, if we're Christians, have a responsibility to partner together in the gospel, in gospel ministry. See, we may not all be gospel pastors, like a Timothy, but we are all gospel partners. So let's do what we can to be like Paul, Paul's posse. And, and I'm sure I speak for, for, um, for Steve and for Chris to say that, um, that we as, as the church pastors really value your love, and your partnership. Um, and, and I guess I can say, particularly as a curate, that Steve, our vicar, he, is, he really needs our support. It's a demanding thing being a church pastor. And, and Paul Ryan is going to um, uh, recommend, uh, sort of do a little book review of this book. It's a book by Christopher Rash. It's called The Book Your Pastor Wishes to Read, but is too embarrassed to ask. So, so Paul is going to save our blushes save our embarrassment he's going to say a few words about that later um, but hopefully you'll, you'll find out a bit more about that um, in uh, in home groups it, it's not a book about two timothy but it's a book about supporting pastors in local churches and there are lots of practical ideas um, and hopefully again they'll they'll come out of this series as we, we, visit, we, we as we revisit them later on but but for now the, the big application is simply to know that um, if we're Christians, then we're all gospel partners. And, and um, that means we'll share in suffering for the gospel. And it's um, part of our uh, responsibility to support um, our pastors um, in that work.
And it's perhaps another mind shift for some, a wake up call, a reminder for others of us. And we need to get our get this clear in our hearts and minds, and then we need to, to get on and and uh, and do it, don't we? So there we are. It's a bit of a GPS for two Timothy. Sometimes good churches go wrong, but we need to keep our eyes on, on, on God's promise of life in Christ. And that means that um, pastors, as, as they keep their eyes fixed on that promise in sharing suffering for the gospel, and, and, and it means that the church family can support them in doing that kind of thing. So there they are. That's what we've seen today from the beginning and at the end of Paul's letter. And that's the kind of message that will run right the way through it. So perhaps a question for us as we finish today is, well, have we reckoned with these truths? Are these new ideas to us? And, and I guess for some of us, these will be familiar truths. But for others, they might be new ideas. But even if we're familiar with them, I'm sure none of us will have fully plumbed their depths. And um, for, for all of us, um, the more these truths change our minds and our hearts, the more they'll change our lives. See, being a Christian will be difficult. It will be tough. But it is infinitely worth it. Because the gospel, the good news, is the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And as Paul concludes his letter, well, may God's grace be with us all. Let's pray together. Uh, loving and gracious Father, uh, we thank you for, for the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And, and we do pray that your grace would go with us as we study this letter to G. Timothy of G. Timothy. We pray that you would help us to be people who have that promised perspective. Help us keep our eyes fixed on the eternal future and that all who trust in Christ will enjoy. And we pray that when things are difficult, that you'd help us to share in suffering for the gospel. Help us to be a church family who, who really partner with one another and support the pastors and partner together. That the gospel would be proclaimed and that Christians would be built up and people who don't yet know and love you would be drawn to put their trust in you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.